Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Welcome to Medford United Methodist Church. It's good to have you with us. My name is Joe Monahan, and on behalf of our staff, our congregation, we want to say thank you so much for being with us this morning. And uh, this morning, we're going to be continuing this series that we've been in for the past several weeks, and it's a, called Half Truths. It's based on the book by the same name by Adam Hamilton. In this uh, series, we're talking about some of the things that we commonly say to each other and whether those things actually square with what we believe about God and about humanity. And so today, we're talking about one that you probably have heard before, and that's the idea of love the sinner and hate the sin. So that's where we're headed this morning. If you are joining us uh, in person today, we hope that you'll take a minute and you'll check in on Facebook. If you're online with us this morning, we hope that you'll share the stream. That's really helpful to us. The ushers will come around in just a moment here if you're in the room, and uh, we hope that you'll take a moment let us know that you've been here by uh, signing your name to that red attendance pad. And if you are visiting with us, maybe for the first time, we want to say a special word of welcome and encourage you to, uh, if you'd be willing to share your contact information, we'd love to let you know about things that are going on here at the church. If you're online with us, you can do the same thing at medfordumc.org Sunday. And there you'll find this week's announcements. You'll find the link to give, our, uh, a link to download our app, uh, our social media feeds, 
a place to submit a prayer request, all those kinds of things. So that's a great way to learn more about the church. And if you'd like, if you're here in the room today, you can scan the QR code on the back of the seat in front of you and you'll get to that very same page. So uh, today I want to remind you of a couple things as we get started. First, our church conference has been rescheduled to uh, Sunday, November the 5th, and we're going to be in person here at the church now. So Sunday, November the 5th at noon, in person with our district superintendent, the Reverend Rennell Howard. So we look forward to that. And uh, it's about an hour long, and all of our members are invited to come and join and uh, be with us that day. So we're looking forward to that. Second, our trunk or treat is coming up next weekend and uh, from 3 to 5 p.m. And it's real, real simple. What we're asking is bring your trunks, um, bring your candy, um, bring the people, the young people in your life. And uh, we'd love to have you come and be part of that from 3 to 5 next Sunday afternoon. So finally, I just want to say I had such a great time last evening at the We Care Festival. I really want to thank the United Women of Faith uh, for planning such a great event, and especially um, Barb Carlson. Um, I just want to give just, <laughs> just a great event where we raised uh, a tremendous amount of money, where we had um, the opportunity to connect with each other, to learn more about the issue of homelessness, to do some really fun activities. And um, I'm really excited now to introduce to you Sam Rudd. And Sam uh, works with the Christian Caring Center, and she manages this Bridge of Hope program that we're raising money for. So Sam, would you like to come and tell us a little bit more about it? Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. So you see how I'm dressed. I was thinking this morning, I got up at 5 o'clock in the morning, I was here in the parking lot, I slept in my car for about 10 hours or so um, for our sleep out, which brings attention to the issue of homelessness that we have in our own backyards. And I live in Elmer and I was thinking, you know what, maybe like I'll leave and I'll run home and I'll take a shower, do my makeup, do my hair, put on something presentable because I'm going to be talking in front of people. And then I thought to myself, like, that's not really the reality of what a lot of my clients go through on an everyday basis, right? So if I was really, you know, a person that was homeless sleeping in my car, I would kind of like do the brushing of my teeth in the parking lot. Fortunately, there is a bathroom here, but do the brushing of my teeth in the parking lot, maybe use some hygiene wipes, put on some deodorant, and kind of how I'm dressed is how it's going to be if I need to go to a job interview, if I need to go somewhere to get some type of services, and then I'm gonna have to sit around and wait until it's time for me to get whatever type of you know, help that I might need. So I just decided, you know what, I'm coming as I am, and I'm going to present about our program, this program that is so amazing. Um, I'm so grateful for the church here for running this move-a-thon, for raising the funds, that they did, which is like at an amazing amount of money right now, that will help take a family from homelessness into safe, affordable, secure housing. A family of probably a single mother, maybe a single father and their children. Um, and that's what we do at Bridge of Hope. Bridge of Hope, there's not another program in the county like Bridge of Hope. I like to say that it's not a band-aid approach, right? So a lot of times when people are in homelessness, people are trying to fulfill those immediate needs. Let me get that person some food or get them some clothing, but they're not really addressing the issues of why somebody became homeless. The face of homelessness isn't what you see when you're going to Philadelphia. It's not the people that are suffering with addictions, alcohol addictions, drug addictions. It's families, it's children, it's senior citizens, it's veteran. That is the true face of homelessness. Um, so with Bridge of Hope, what we do, we're a housing first program. So we take a family that maybe is living in their car, maybe they're you know, being put up by the Board of Social Services and emergency assistance. I've had families that were living in the woods. I had a pregnant single mom living in the woods that we brought into the program, not even 20 minutes from here, right? So this is literally in your backyard. Um, so we put them into safe, affordable housing, and then we work with them for 12 to 24 months. So we're working on budgeting and, you know, basic life skills that a lot of people, for whatever reason, may not have. We're working with whatever issues they may be having with its trauma or mental health or 
just, you know, all the many reasons, if it was a person that became homeless because of domestic violence, which is really what we're seeing with single mothers, primarily the reason that they're becoming homeless is because of domestic violence issues. So we're addressing those issues as well. So this family comes into the program, they're put into housing, they connect with me, I work with all that social service stuff, all the, all the hard stuff, right? All of this stuff that may be um, affecting them, you know, psychologically. But we also have like another component of the program, which is where you guys will come in, called a neighboring team. A neighboring team is from an area church, six to eight people, to basically work with these families, walk with these families, just be a support system to these families. Because if you think about it, if you need somebody to talk to, you can pick up the phone and call maybe a family member, a friend, a coworker. Our families don't have that. When I do intake with these families and I say, okay, if you have an emergency, if there's somebody I need to contact, um, who is your support system? They can't name anyone. And that's always so heartbreaking to me because you're going through this struggle alone without having anybody to say, you know what, I'm gonna do this walk with you because this is truly faith in action, right? I'm gonna do this walk with you. I'm gonna support you. Just reach out to you and see, how are you doing? How are the kids doing? Is there anything that you need? Um, it's that simple. That's all we're really asking of people to really just do this walk with people from homelessness to self-sustainability. Um, it's not a big commitment. Basically, we will meet together once a month for some type of activity. So like, if you're having a barbecue at your house and you're a neighboring team, you might say, hey Sam, neighboring family, why don't you guys all come over and like join my family for a barbecue? Or my kids love to make Christmas cookies, bring your kids over and we're gonna make Christmas cookies together. We also ask that people, you know, on a rotating basis, reach out to the family, send them a card, send them a text. I'm thinking about you, I'm praying for you. Is there anything that you know you want me to pray for, or anything that you may need? And that's done on a rotating basis. And I will say that is probably the most important piece besides the housing of our program, just giving people support. When people are going through trauma and homelessness in itself is a, is a trauma in itself, people need support, right? How do people get over trauma? By building relationships. So if anybody is interested in maybe being a part of a neighboring team, I would love to come back. I actually have to leave today because I have to be somewhere at 10, but, um, which I'm gonna be late for, but that's okay. But, um, but if you're interested in a neighboring team, please let Barb know or let you know Pastor know, and I will come to a service meet with the group after the service to give you more information about how you can become involved because this program really does change lives. It's amazing to watch a family that just has no hope and no thought of, you know, where am I gonna sleep tomorrow? Where, what are we gonna eat tonight? To just go from having that to like their own apartment and to be able to just watch that progression is absolutely amazing. Um, our success rate with this program is about an 85% success rate, meaning that these families do stay in their homes. They're not experiencing the recidivism that we see a lot um, with homelessness. And it's just like an amazing thing to be a part of. So if anybody's interested, please let us know and we'll set up a time to talk about how you guys can become a part of that. Thanks, Sam. So friends, in just a little while, um, I'll share the totals and where we are and tell you how you can make a donation to help fund this. We're really grateful to Sam and for the Christian Caring Center for being part of this pro program. And I just want to say one more thing before we uh, turn over to Nate. I just want to say on behalf of Kate and myself, a, a very sincere thank you. Um, so uh, our staff parish committee showed up at the house the other day with a gift bag um, as a sign of Pastor Appreciation Month, but also in celebrating our honeymoon as we get ready uh, to take a couple weeks off. So thank you so much. Uh, by extension, I want to thank the SPR, but also by extension, all of you. So thank you very much. All right, Nate, we'll turn it over to you. Welcome, everyone. Good morning. It's so good to be with you today in our time of worship. As you're comfortable and you're able, please stand with us and let's lift our voices together. Come on. 
you thirsty, come to the well that never runs dry. Drink of the water, come and thirst no more. Come all you sinners. Come all you sinners, come find the mercy. Come to the table that will satisfy. Taste of the goodness, find what you're looking for. Indescribable, uncontainable, 
the band plays, I'm going to invite everyone to take a few minutes to share a piece with one another. Let's go ahead and do that now. All right, I'd like to invite all the children to come on up for our kids' time. All right, nice shirt. Nice shirt. How are you guys doing? Wow, Eagles fans here today, huh? How's everybody doing? Good. Hey, guys, are you getting ready for something special coming up? What, what, what's happening? Halloween? Really? An Eagles game. Four o'clock? All right. Very good. Now, you know the Phillies are winning too. So I'm going to root for them tomorrow, right? And Tuesday and Thursday and Friday. We only need four games, right? Huh? But guess what? I'm going to root for the Eagles too. You ready? Huh? <laughs> I'm not as talented as Mrs. Kelsey. I couldn't sew them together. <laughs> all right. Well, let's see what we got today. Did you all have your costumes for Halloween? You're getting one today? You got it? You're going to get one? Okay. You got one. All right. Oh, Billy. Don't tell me. What did you get in my house? I have to guess who you are, right? Actually, nobody comes to my house. Do you know that? Nobody comes to my house. I know, but nobody still comes. Oh, <laughs> uh, well, I have a question for you today. Can anybody tell me what this is? You think so? You're pretty sure? What if I said this was God? Maybe? Maybe? You, you believe me? Well, yes and no. I'm really kidding. It's, it's not really God, but it reminds me of God. Because one time I had a professor in seminary, and I came in to the class, and I was complaining about all the stuff I did at church that week. 
which is basically changing light bulbs, moving chairs around, and I forget what else. And she said to me, everything's spiritual, so make everything spiritual. So the light reminds me of God, because in the Bible there's a verse that says, God is light, and in God there is no darkness at all. So this reminds me of God. Now, what ways can light help us? Pardon me? In the dark. How can it help us in the dark? Very good. To help you join trick or treat? Yeah. Oh, yeah. How about when you get up at night, out of bed? Can it help then? You know, we just got a new bed. I'm going to introduce you to somebody. That, that's Mrs. Wills. And that's Maddie, that's, that's our grandson. We just got a new bed. And guess what happens when you get out of the bed? Lights come on. All around the frame, lights come on so we can see where we're going. I didn't even know it until the guy set it up and said, watch this. I'm like, wow, okay. So yeah, it can help us when we get up. How about if you have a bad dream? You wake up in the dark, turn the light on, does that help? Yeah, okay. Sometimes. Call her mom. Maybe she turns the light on, huh? How about if you're driving in the car with mom and dad in the darkness? Do they turn on the headlights or do they drive without the headlights? Yeah. They turn the headlights on so they can see where they're going. Okay. All right. Now, how about when you're reading? Do you turn the light on? Do you? Good. You need that. You know, my wife does. She reads in the dark. I don't know how she does it. I have to turn the light on. You read in the dark, too. That's funny. Now, when I was your age, I like to read a lot. I used to be under the covers with my with a flashlight reading. Anybody do that? No. No? Don't do that? Try it sometime. Sometimes? Yeah. It's fun. It's fun to do. All right. So we got this light. Now, how about if you're trying to find something in your closet or under the bed? Sometimes they can be kind of dark. Not all closets have light. Some closets have light. Other closets don't have light. You doesn't have one? No. Yeah, now, this light might do pretty good in the closet or in the bed, but it's, it's, do you think it's kind of dim? Yeah? So you think we might need something a little bit brighter? What do you think about this one? Huh? How about this one? Huh? That one? Yeah, we can even see it with all these lights on in here. So if I'm looking in the bed or in my closet, I can really find something. I have to tell you, bright, oh, I'm sorry about that. I keep forgetting how bright this is. One time, I didn't use a light like this to look for something in my closet or under the bed. I can't remember exactly where it was. But I was using a light like this. And it was really early in the morning. I had to go to church really early. I forget what was going on. I had to be there really early. I didn't want to wake Mrs. Wills up. So I went in with the light, and I looked all around. I got what I, I needed. And when I got to church and turned all the lights on, guess what I found out? Look at my feet. Does something look funny there? I had on two different colors of shoes. Hmm. I mean, the shoes look kind of alike, don't they? But this is brown and this one's black. Yeah. You know, I should have made that mixed match day at church, shouldn't I? Hmm. Yep. Whoop. Whoa. So it was a little embarrassing. I finally ran home and got, got the other, other one, the right one. So anyway. But, you know, if I used a bright light, it probably would have been all right. And, you know, it, in the Bible, it talks about something that kind of relates to this with, with this light. Besides the verse I just told you about where God is light. You know, sometimes we shine, a you know, you didn't like that light in your eyes. Sometimes we shine like a really bright light, so to speak, on somebody else. And we kind of look for things that mm, maybe we don't care for, we think that are wrong. What's the matter, Bubby? Huh? You, you want this? Okay. Take it to Grandma. Uh, we may not like the way they comb their hair. Maybe we don't like the way they talk. Maybe we don't like the way they, they play with us. Maybe we don't like the clothes they wear or the team that they support. I mean, who should you support? 
Eagles? Cowboys. How about the Dallas Cowboys? No, oh, okay, no. <laughs> huh? And the Flyers. How about the Sixers, too? Yeah, Sixers? Yeah. Yes? Yeah, Six. Not the Sixers? Yeah. See? But sometimes we might think those kind of things are like flaws in other people. We get, we get kind of uh, judgmental. We think that they don't, they, they're not right in things. They don't believe like we believe. And then we think they're doing everything wrong, and they're not very good or very nice. But you know what Jesus says? Any idea what Jesus says about that? Huh? We're going to hear it in a little, little bit. But Jesus says, hey, guys, don't be so harsh. Don't be so hard on people. Uh, don't, don't really judge others. Take a look at yourself. Ooh, how about that? Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. He <laughs> says, take a look at yourself. Because are we all perfect? Hmm? No. Is Mary Poppins? No, she's not perfect either, right? She says practically perfect, but not perfect, right? So no one's perfect. Uh, and even one of Jesus' followers said, you know, everybody's sinned. Everybody's done something wrong. Everybody's made a mistake, and they've fallen short of God's glory. So here's what I think we should be doing this week and all the weeks after that. What are you doing now? Huh? You want to go back to Grandma? We need to make sure we turn that. Well, can I have the bright light? Huh? Rather than shine the light, the real bright light on somebody else and looking for things that might be wrong with them, we should shine the light on ourselves and see what kind of mistakes we have made, maybe. Because, like, I made a mistake there, yep. Yeah, see what kind of mistakes we, we might make. So what are some things we might do to improve ourselves as followers of Jesus? What can we, might, what can we do better, maybe? Anybody have brothers and sisters? Oh, right there? Yeah. Is your brother? Do you always get along? No. No. No, I have dog sisters. You fight every day. Well, now maybe you have to try and get along better. How's that? Be patient with each other. Don't yell at each other, huh? Okay. Maybe you have to say yes sometime, huh? Maybe. Yeah, we'll say we can, we can try it, right? How about how about treat others fairly? Maybe share things better. Hmm? Can we do that? How about, do we always listen to our moms and dads? No. <sighs> Maybe we need to listen to them better and then do what they tell us to do, huh? Or how about our teachers? Huh? You listen to the teachers? Maybe? Okay. So, instead of looking for some flaws in other people, think what you can do to be better. All right. You know, guys, I think you did a really good job today. I'm really, I'm really proud of you, Jim. You came up with some really good things and shared a lot of stuff. And, of course, you also talked about supporting the right teams. So it's Go Eagles today? Go Eagles? Okay. Now, just to make sure we can do all this, should we have a word of prayer? Can we pray together? You sure? Wait, I have one vote to pray together. Anybody else vote to pray together? Huh? Let's pray together. You can repeat after me. So let's say... Dear God, we're so glad to be here today to see friends and teachers, to sing, to hear the music, and offer our prayers. Thank you for being with each of us every moment of our lives. And God, Help us not to be judgmental towards others. But help us to see the mistakes we may make. And help us to love others as much as you love us. And treat them as you treat us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, ready to go back to Kids Corner.
Good morning. Today's reading comes from the Gospel of Matthew, the seventh chapter, beginning with verse one. Don't judge so that you won't be judged. You'll receive the same judgment you give. Whatever you deal out will be dealt out to you. Why do you see the splinter that's in your brother's or sister's eye, but don't notice the log that's in your own eye? How can you say to your brother or sister, let me take the splinter out of your eye when there's a log in your own eye? You deceive yourself. First, take the log out of your eye, and then you'll see clearly to take the splinter out of your brother's or sister's eye. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. So we want to thank uh, Perry Smith for sharing the scripture reading with us today from South Carolina. Let's take a moment and pray together. God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for all the gifts that you've poured into our lives. And just pray that as we think together about the scripture, that you might be at work in our hearts and our minds, in our hearing and in our understanding. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Love the sinner, hate the sin. So this is one that most of us have heard at least a few times. Depending on who we are, we may have heard it a lot. People who say this generally tend to be pretty devout people loving people, caring people who don't necessarily aim to do anyone any harm. But if you haven't picked up on it so far, one of the common threads through the series is the idea that these things that we say just kind of reflexively really do hurt people sometimes. And this one is no different. So we might start by looking at where does this idea come from, love the sinner, hate the sin? Well, there was a bishop of the church, um, St. Augustine of Hippo. He was the first one that phrased something like this. We can't find it in the Old Testament, we can't find it in the New Testament, we can't find it in the words of Jesus. But instead, the first thing that's kind of like this comes from St. Augustine, from about 424, a letter that he as bishop had written to a group of nuns saying that they should have a love for people and a hatred of sin. It was later that in Mahatma Gandhi's 1929 autobiography that he talked about this same saying. And when he quoted it, he actually pointed to the idea that it's kind of a half-truth. And most people, when they quote Gandhi will lift this up saying, look, Gandhi, you know, agreed with this. But as is typical, the quote's frequently taken out of context. If you read the whole quote, what he actually says is this, hate the sin and not the sinner is a precept which, though easy enough to understand, is rarely practiced. And that's why the poison of hatred spreads in the world. So, easy to understand, but rarely practiced. That about sums it up. So first, let's make one thing clear. It is true, the scripture says that all of us are sinners. That's biblical. Romans 3.23, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. This word that we translate as sin, whether it's from the Hebrew of the Old Testament, the Greek of the New Testament, kind of has the same sense to it. It's always about the idea of missing the mark, like with an arrow in archery, or like wandering away from the path if you're walking down kind of a, a forest trail. We all sin. It's impossible for us to do otherwise because we are human and we are flawed. We miss the target, we step off the path, and we hurt people. Now, mostly unintentionally, but occasionally very intentionally. And when we do that, we sin against one another, we sin against God. There's this line in our funeral liturgy that I love, but I don't always use. And when we pray for the deceased, it's part of that prayer. And what the line says is this, Acknowledge, we humbly beseech you, 
a sheep of your own fold, a lamb of your own flock, a sinner of your own redeeming. I don't always use it. Because I'm never 100% sure how the family might actually react to me offering a prayer for their family member, the sinner. I figure you have to be pretty deeply invested in the church for that to make sense to you. But still, some folks do get it. And so from time to time, when people use this saying, they'll use it kind of in this way. We're, we're all sinners. I'm a sinner too. And you know, in God's eyes, no sin is worse than any other. We're all sinners. Now, I get the idea behind that. God is holy and we are not, so all of us are imperfect. Any degree of imperfection is being out of sync with God, and when we're out of sync with God, it doesn't matter how out of sync we are. But really, we want to make the argument that at the end of a long day, if you're short with the customer service representative, that's the same as cheating on your spouse. That's the same as murdering someone. We really want to make that argument? That all those sins are the same? I get where the idea comes from, because Jesus talks, for example, in Matthew 5, when he talks about adultery, he says even to look at someone with lust is to commit adultery with them. But is the point of what Jesus is saying to make clear that the thought is every bit as bad as the action. I don't think so. Jesus frequently spoke in hyperbolic language, like overly inflated, overly exaggerated language. And he did that for two reasons, to get your attention, first of all, and then to make his point. And here the point is that we need to guard our thoughts because thoughts lead to actions. Now, it is true that the church has historically been much more interested in certain sins than other sins, and with sexual sins being absolutely at the top of the list, the thing that we are obsessed with. So when we hear this love the sinner, hate the sin, now, today, it's most frequently something that gets cited in the context of a conversation about where our ministry with LGBTQ plus people fits into the life of the church. And I'll get to the reasons why that's particularly problematic in just a moment. But I want to say first that Jesus never said, again, he never said anything about loving sinners. He talked about loving your neighbors, but he never talked about loving sinners. Even that love your neighbor, that wasn't original to Jesus. That actually comes from Leviticus. Leviticus chapter 19, verse 18. Love your neighbor as yourself. Now, it's true that Jesus was a friend of sinners. But when Jesus says that, he actually is quoting people who are his opponents who use that phrase to make fun of him. So the context is Jesus is talking about how people are accusing him of things. It says they say he's a glutton and a drunk, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Jesus doesn't call himself that. He doesn't call himself a friend of sinners, but he says that the religious authorities thought that about him. I don't think that's how he thought about himself. Instead, he thought of himself as loving his neighbor. He wasn't about loving sinners, even though they were that, even though we all are that. He never taught love the sinner, because I think that he knew exactly where that would lead, that it would lead towards judging others and setting ourselves above them. Now, we see it all the time. We see it in the spiritually prideful people 
who pretend that that word sinner just doesn't apply to them. And I get it, because it's not a comfortable thing for us to think of ourselves as sinners. We may know that according to the scriptures, that's true. We get it in the abstract, but for us to wear that label around, for us to carry it all the time, is something that's too heavy for us. Forgiven people, people who understand what God has done for them, people who have met Jesus and know Jesus, they can say, yeah, I'm a sinner, but God's forgiveness is new every morning. Thank you, Jesus. And understand that day by day by day, we have that opportunity to start new. But there are so many people who haven't yet experienced that sense of God's love for them, God's forgiveness toward them, that they can get stuck on that idea of their own worthlessness, the idea that they absolutely can't be forgiven. And if that's you today, I want to make one thing really, really clear, and that is that you absolutely can be forgiven. That's why Jesus talks less about people's sin and more about God's forgiveness. And that's why sinners wanted to be Jesus' friend, because he spent more time talking about God's forgiveness than their sin. The fact that the church is so much better at talking about people's sin than talking about God's forgiveness is a source of so much spiritual pain in this world that I can't help when I think about it to feel just a sense of outrage. In the same way that I imagine Jesus felt a sense of outrage when he thought about the ways in which religion, faith, was being used to keep people down. And I feel this in particular when I think about my friends in the LGBTQ plus community. And it's here that love the sin or hate the sin is particularly harmful. Because when someone stands before you, comes out to you, and says, please hear me. This is who I am. This is who I'm attracted to. This is the person I love. And we judge that. It's impossible in that moment for us to separate the sin from the sinner. Sin from sinner. You just can't do it. Because we're talking about someone's identity. And so, yeah, I hold the church accountable for the fact that LGBTQ plus youth are four times more likely to attempt suicide than their straight peers. Four times. There's a study done a couple years ago that revealed that among LGBTQ plus youth, 45% had contemplated suicide in the previous year. 45%. Almost half. And so if you want to know why it matters that we are not only a welcoming but an affirming congregation, one that welcomes and affirms, in other words, doesn't point, this, point to this as this is sin, the reason for that is because literally this is a matter of life and death. Judge not, lest ye be judged. Does that mean we can have no moral opinion? Of course not. There is right and wrong in this world. Does that mean we can say nothing on any issue ever? Of course not, because there are times when not to speak out about an injustice is itself an injustice. But the point of Jesus saying don't judge is that it's a warning to us 
not to fall into that trap of self-righteousness, which is exactly where love the sinner, hate the sin leads us into a trap of self-righteousness. There's only one thing, only one part of the statement that is the whole truth here. The first word, love. Love, love. That's the truth. And that's the only truth. It is not our job to judge. That is God's job. It's not even our job to convict people of sin. That is the Holy Spirit's job. Instead, our job is this. To witness to the goodness and the love of God in this world. The love and forgiveness of God that we've known in the face of Jesus Christ. That is our task. That's all there is. Let's pray together. God, we thank you for all that you've done for us. We thank you that we are forgiven people, that we are your beloved people. And we pray that as we continue to live into our belovedness, that we might grow in our understanding of the ways that our judgment of others hurts and doesn't help. Pray that you might continue to enlighten us, continue to remind us that we are forgiven people so that we might continue to share your good news and your love in the world. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.
So friends, a little bit earlier, we talked about uh, the Bridge of Hope Project. I want to announce to you this morning that um, we are at $9,900 so far against our $12,000 goal. So we are very, very close uh, to meeting this. And we only have, what, what does that make, $2,100 left to go? Yeah, $2,100 left to go in order to close this out. And I know that we can get there today. If you want to stop by, uh, there will be some folks outside uh, this morning, and they'll have the QR code. You can scan that. You, they'll accept your donations um, specifically to this project. We really want to fund this and uh, help one family uh, in this program for one year. Really excited to be able to partner with Christian Caring Center on this. So we thank you for your support. So as we move on to our time of prayer, um, you know, this week has been hard. We've all been watching the news. And last week, the news that came out of Israel was so fresh that I really didn't have much of an idea of what, what to think or what to say. And honestly, I still don't. There are two things that I can say for sure. The first is that the slaughter of Jewish people of men and women and children is an ancient evil that we as Christians have to condemn. We can also say that right now there is a humanitarian disaster unfolding in Gaza and potentially throughout all the Palestinian territories. That suffering is also beyond our comprehension. And again, it affects men and women and children. So today, I feel called to pray not for anyone's victory, but to pray for everyone's security and safety. For the Israeli people, for the Palestinian people, for people who are Jewish and Muslim and Christian. Because we forget at times that when we talk about Palestinians, we're talking about Christians as well who live in those territories. I wish there was more that it made sense for us to say or me to say, but I fear that everything else is simply too complicated and too difficult. So as we pray today, I'll leave space for you to lift up your concerns. Uh, if you're online with us today, we encourage you to lift up your concerns in the chat as we pray together. Let's just pray uh, using first names. So let's take a moment now. First, with a couple deep breaths, just to go to God in prayer together. God, we give you thanks for this day. We give you thanks for gathering us together for everything that your work in our lives means for us. We look at the state of the world and we wonder, how could this possibly be? In Israel, in Gaza, in Ukraine, Lord, we pray for all those who are affected by these conflicts all those who have lost loved ones, Russian families, Ukrainian families, Palestinian families, Israeli families. Lord, we pray for all those who have lost loved ones. And we pray for peace and security for your people, wherever they are. And we reaffirm once more that we believe we are all your people and pray that you might surround each and every person with your peace, with your protection on this day. God, closer to home, we know that there are people that we're concerned for, people that we're praying for, and I invite you to lift up those names now.
Lord, today we, all, we pray for all those who are experiencing homelessness. And we pray for this mission and ministry that you've given us to do, to care for those who find themselves without a place to sleep. God, we give you thanks in all things that you've called us to be your people, that you've given us your work to do, and that you empower that work through the power of your Holy Spirit. We pray all these things in the name of your Son, Jesus, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. As you are able, please stand with us as we sing How Great Thou Art. Friends, as we go forth in this place, we go forth knowing that God goes with us. We go forth knowing that it's not our calling to judge. It's not our calling to convict people of sin. It is our job to love and to love people well. So go forth in the name, the power, the grace, and the love of Jesus Christ. Amen.